to uh, welcome everyone to the virtual FFD site event, uh, Effective Stimulus Policies to Sustain MSMEs and the Creative Economy Sector uh, in uh, coordination uh, between Government uh, of Indonesia uh, with UNCTAD. And uh, before we begin uh, the session, I would like to kindly ask um, the welcoming remarks from uh, Director for Development, Economic and Environmental Affairs, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of the Republic of Indonesia, Mr. Uh, Hari Prabowo, to uh, open uh, this uh, session. Please, Pat. Thank you very much, uh, Yvonne. Uh, very warm greetings from uh, Jakarta. Uh, our dearest colleagues, uh, Chandeline and Tatiana Krilova from UNCTAD, uh, Dr. Adi Budiarso, Head of Center for Financial Policy Sector, uh, Indonesian Ministry of Finance, Mr. Charles Osisi, Executive Director of Empretec, Uganda, Ms. Julian Omala, Chief Executive Director of Delight Uganda, Uganda. Ms. Olainka Jacobs Bonik, Founder of South South Art and Culture Collective of Jamaica, uh, distinguished participants. Uh, it is truly a pleasure and an honor for me to welcome all of you at this event to discuss effective stimulus policies to sustain uh, MSMEs or MISMI and the creative economy. We all understand how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted every country and every economy. Uh, creative economy players who are mostly self-employed uh, and freelancers, as well as Miss Me with their limited access to financial and social inclusion are amongst the hardest hit by the multidimensional impacts of the pandemic. Countries around the world have come up with various incentive and support schemes for those affected by the downturn. And this provides us with a wealth of lessons learned and best practices that are valuable for promoting recovery and enhancing resilience. In this regard, we hope this side event will shed more light on the importance of specific and targeted government interventions towards MISMI and the creative economy uh, in promoting stronger and inclusive recovery. For Indonesia, MISMI and creative economy are key to recovery. MISMI is by far the largest economic sector employing 97% of the working population. And as such, the largest share of our economic recovery program budget uh, is targeting MISMI in order to support their resilience and the economy as a whole. At this juncture, allow me to share some preliminary reflections. First, assistance to MISMI is not only a powerful instrument for recovery, but also crucial for attaining the SDGs. Targeting MISMI will impact several development objectives at once, such as local economic empowerment, reducing poverty, and stimulate employment. Additionally, policies can be put in place to encourage green recovery, such as providing credit priority to economic units and MISMI that support green economic activities. Second, accelerating the progress on sustainable development should be done through inclusive, participatory, and impactful multi-stakeholder partnership. Even before the pandemic, we have sought to support the growth and development of MISMI by improving financial inclusion, specifically to close the gaps in accessing financing. On this issue, our speaker from the Indonesian Fiscal Policy Agency will speak more. Third, Various creative economy subsectors can play an important role for economic recovery. And at the same time, there is an urgent need to enhance financial and social inclusion of creative entrepreneurs. This is one of our major tasks in implementing the International Year of Creative Economy for Sustainable Development. And the role that women and youth play in these subsectors cannot be understated their importance for inclusivity and empowerment cannot be downplayed. In closing, I would like to again thank you all once again for your participation, and I wish you a very productive discussion. We hope that today's event will enrich the discussion on financing for development and contribute to designing relevant policies to accelerate recovery within the framework of the 2030 Agenda. I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Director Prabowo, for the welcoming remarks. And now uh, we will begin, and I would like to give uh, the screen and microphone uh, to our moderator for this morning, Ms. Chantaline Carpenter uh, Schiff, UNCTAD New York Office of the Secretary General. Chantaline, the screen and microphone is all yours. 
Thank you so much, Ivan. It's such a pleasure to be in, in uh, such good company this morning. And uh, Mr. Bravo, uh, very nice um, to have you with us. And thank you for these uh, excellent remarks. I'm not going to use much more time except to explain that UNCTAD is very pleased to work with the mission of Indonesia in New York to the United Nations on the celebration of the International Year of Creative Economy, because we believe that uh, the creative economy has a huge impact on the and, and offer great opportunities for developing countries um, and our offer resilience in these time of crisis, though during COVID-19, as um, uh, Mr. Prabowo just mentioned, has been hit very hard. So what we want to discuss this morning is how do we ensure that these recovery do serve MSMEs and the creative economy sector who are um, such uh, of importance in terms of job creation and uh, growth. So without further ado, and with all protocol observed, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Um, actually, I'm, I have to say that Dr. Adi, um, Dr. Fabrio Nathan Kataribu uh, can no longer, longer join us this morning, but we are very delighted to have Dr. Adi Budiaso, the head of the Center for Financial Sector Policy and the Fiscal Policy Agency, Ministry of Finance, um, in uh, Indonesia, um, to and is a fellow certified practicing accountant. So we have a lot of accountants this morning. Our my colleague Tatiana is also a certified accountant. So, um, dear Andy, uh, um, just a few words about him. So he joined in 2020 as the head of the Center for Finance Sector uh, Policies. Uh, prior, to, uh, he, prior to this, he served as the head of the Center for Climate Change and Multilateral Policy. Um, and then um, joining the, before joining the Fiscal Policy Agency, Dr. Adi served as the head of the Finance Profession Supervisory Agency um, in 2019 and Human Capital Advisor to the Secretary General of the Ministry of Finance, of, of Foreign Affairs from uh, November 2018 to 2019. Uh, and he has a long career with the World Bank and others. So uh, clearly very qualified to speak to us this morning about these issues. So uh, Dr. Budiaso, you have the screen this morning. Many thanks, Kanta. Uh, really great moderator. <laughs> it's really pleased to hear that. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Ari Prabowo, uh, the director from Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I think this is really great to have all of us here, the honorable panelists, moderators, and honorable guests and participants. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to share a uh, very good morning to all of us and also good evening in some uh, of us. I would like to uh, <clears throat> particularly uh, share about the uh, several key points here. Uh, first of all, let's uh, briefly discuss about the global and domestic economic updates and following up the several discussion about MSMEs during the hard times and uh, how then we can uh, try to be more adaptive, more resilient and also uh, recover it soon in the economy. Ladies and gentlemen, the global economy faces challenges one after another in the last two decades. The world has, was hit by the global financial crisis, European debt crisis, taper tantrum, and trade war. But none of that compares to the pressure caused by the COVID-19 pandemics. The impact was this devastating. The global economy plunged into recession in 2020. While we are starting to see some recoveries, with developing countries as the main growth engines, risks are still looming on the horizon. That is why 2021 and 2022 will be the critical transition for all of us. In Indonesia, the government plays the vital role, the center of, for recovery, with the government consumption as the main economic driver, a path to recover and can be seen in the second semester of 2020 and is expected to continue in 2021. Indonesia's economy is projected to grow four to 5%. Ladies and gentlemen, state budget has been uh, the main instrument <clears throat> in corresponding to the pandemic. In 2020, we particularly implemented extraordinary policies, including widening budget deficit to 6.34% of GDP, 
previously Indonesia maintaining discipline below 3%. And the nice we run the National Economic Recovery Program, so-called PEN. The result has been positive. The state budget has successfully limited the impact of the pandemic by implementing a counter-cyclical policy, preventing a deeper contraction in the economy. Even so, in 2021, the state budget and fiscal policy will continue to play its important role in driving the recovery of Indonesian economy. For 2021, particularly, we designed a policy framework that we believe will be a game changer to accelerate the national economic recovery. First, we have the health intervention plan to limit the spread of COVID-19. It was continuation from the previous 2022 20, uh, year. This includes the administration of vaccination. As of 10 of April, more than 14 million doses have been administered, and we hope to accelerate this process in the second semester of 2021. Next, we have the survival and recovery kit, which in the National Economic Recovery Program, or so-called PAN program, that includes supports for the bottom 40% of the vulnerable groups, as well as for businesses support. Then we have the structural reform to address various challenges of the national development. The PEN program is one of the key instruments for handling the impact of COVID-19. This year's program is continuation of last year, 2020's program that has been refined with the result of our evaluations and inputs from stakeholders. 2021's budget allocation for PAN program is larger than 2020, displaying the government in Russia commitment to accelerate economic recovery. Ladies and gentlemen, MSMEs plays very important role in the Indonesia economy. They constitute 99.99 of total businesses in Indonesia. It absorbs 97% of the total workforce and contributes significantly to GDP. MSMEs has managed to survive past crisis, but the COVID-19 pandemic was hit MSMEs pretty severely. Survey shows that majority of SMS, MSMEs are heavily impacted by the pandemic, especially due to the increase in materials prices and decrease in the demand. 88% of the businesses experienced decrease in demand and 77% of businesses experienced decrease in revenue. Nevertheless, nevertheless, MSMEs still show resilience, its resilience, particularly micro enterprises while more than 60% affected small, medium, and large enterprises reduced their workers, majority of micro enterprises retains their workers. To provide an overview of the government support for MSMEs, several programs are in place. First one is the loan interest subsidy as a support for MSMEs affected by by liquidity and solvency issues. Next, we have micro enterprise grants as the productive assistance for micro enterprises. We also have guarantee scheme to encourage banks to distribute working capital loans to MSMEs. The government also places its funds in banks in central and local as support for banking liquidity to do the restructuring and channeling additional or new working capital loans to MSMEs. We also provide several financing facilities for SMS, MSMEs, including the ultra micro financing program for ultra micro business that have not been able to access financing from the banks. We also believe 
that going digital is very, very important and beneficial for MSMEs. We are planning to have half of our MSMEs, around 30 million of them, to go digital by 2030, 23. As of 2020, around 12 million MSMEs have gone digital. To accelerate this process, we have formulated a set of strategies to support the digital MSMEs ecosystem. Our strategies include promoting policies and regulations that strikes a balance between innovation and consumer protection, building strong and robust integration, integrated basic and financial infrastructure, providing financial assistance, improving and enforcing consumer protection, and also organizing financial education to society, especially since the early years at schools. Specifically for the tourism and creative economy sector, we have formulated several supports. In the supply side, for example, we provide credit relaxation and restructuring except accelerating the distribution of working capital loans through guarantee schemes and fund replacement, as well as providing financial support for the movie industry, for example. We have planning to provide stimulus for film production, as well as providing support to cinemas through a national campaign. Vaccination is also currently being accelerated in main tourism destinations such as Bali, Batam, and Bintan. Over the demand side, the government is running the proud to be made Indonesian product as the campaign for the wonderful Indonesia campaign to increase the demand for MSMEs products and services, especially in the tourism area. We also plan to provide discount vouchers and relaxation of travel requirements to encourage people to be vaccinated. As for uh, movie industry, one potential support that we hope will increase the demand for the Indonesian movies is by providing ticket subsidy. Ladies and gentlemen, another vital support that the government provides to MSMEs is through structural reforms. The crisis becomes a momentum to continue Indonesia's structural reform as it's critical prerequisite to be able to transform our economy towards becoming a developed country. Five priorities strategies have been set in our reforms agenda, namely human resource development, infrastructure development, bureaucratic reform, regulator simplification, and economic transformation. Our projection is that these structural reforms could accelerate average economic growth from 5.1% if we do business as usual to 6%. One example of our commitment to continue structural reform is the enactment of omnibus law in job creation. The objective of this law is promoting job creation, easing the opening of new job fields, streamlining and helping the eradication of corruption. The omnibus law also provides many supports for SMEs, such as legal assistance and protection, prioritizing of MSE products for government procurements, ease of financing and fiscal incentives, and also central and local government synergy in managing MSMEs. The omnibus law also simplifies the business license process, making it easier to establish a limited liability corporation or a limited corporation, file patents, and register trademarks. In addition, various tax provision is included in the omnibus law to provide ease of doing business, boost investment, and provides assurance. To name a view, we reduce the corporate income tax rates, remove tax on dividends, and implement the territorial-based tax system. Another important reform to fast-track the development of MSMEs 
is the reform on financial sector. We are currently drafting the omnibus law, another omnibus law, on financial sector development and strengthening. One of its objective is to accelerate the inclusion and the deepening of MSMEs to the financial sector. In this area, the reform includes providing financial literacy and financial inclusion program, implementing the tiered microfinance service supervisory system, promoting the consolidation of microfinance service and providers, strengthening the legal basis for FinTech, and establishing the integrated MSME database. We believe these reforms would make it easier for MSMEs to access the financing as required to expand their business. Before uh, conclude or finishing my presentation, I would like to reiterate the government of Indonesia is committed to accelerate the economic recovery process. We do believe that MSMEs are the important part of the economy and has proven to be resilient in the, during the crisis. Therefore, MSMEs should be fully supported. This is our commitment and we do encourage other economies to do so as well. Thank you for your kind attention. Chantaline, sorry, you're still muted. Oh, how did that happen? Sorry. <laughs> Dr. Budiaso, thank you so much. This is uh, impressive, the work that um, the Indonesia is doing. And um, to take the advantage of this crisis, uh, which is unfortunate, but basically to um, develop more inclusive policies uh, that include MSMEs and the bottom 40%. Because that's the only way we're going to have an inclusive recovery and address inequality at the same time as um, restarting our uh, better our economies. And I was very interested to see that you also facilitate the creation of not only of, of registering business to go from informal to formal, but also cooperatives, which have been shown to be very resilient and support um, the bottom 40% of the population. So very interesting and it sets the ground for um, going forward. And what I find exciting, um, Dr. Budiaso and Dr. Pabobo, is that we have Asia, Africa, and Latin America represent, the Caribbean represented here. And so we can learn um, amongst ourselves here. So I'm very excited about this. Before we go though um, to the, the uh, Asia and Latin America, to Africa and Latin America, I'd like to introduce my colleague Tatiana Krilova, who is the head of enterprise branch division on investment and enterprise development at UNCTAD. Uh, she leads, leads our work on formulating and implementing the accounting development tool for developing countries. And she's also a pioneer in developing guidance core SDG indicators for the private sector to report against the SDGs. And uh, with UNEP being um, co-custodian of indicator 12.6.1, on the reporting of the role of business in achieving the SDGs. So, uh, and Tatiana is also, of course, our lead on the entrepreneurship policy framework, where we offer technical assistance for countries on developing their entrepreneurship uh, um, capacity, but also our Empretech centers. Um, so she's behind all of that great work and she's gonna tell you more. Tatiana, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chantaline, for such a comprehensive introduction. And uh, of course, uh, good morning, good afternoon uh, uh, to participants. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for uh, Mission of Indonesia uh, to um, initiate this uh, very, very important discussion. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Um, yes, so then uh, with this uh, comprehensive introduction uh, that uh, uh, lays out what we do at the inter enterprise branch, I would really like to focus more on the entrepreneurship policies, but then we can really go into uh, some further details as we move on with the discussion. So uh, next slide, please, um, uh, Chantaline. Uh, uh, 
so I would really not uh, spend too much time uh, talking about the uh, role of uh, entrepreneurship and SMEs uh, in economy and also in the post-COVID-19 uh, recovery. Uh, uh, very important things have, have been already said, and I would really like to uh, um, congratulate Dr. Uh, Adi uh, Budiarso with uh, such a comprehensive introduction uh, on this matter. So I would really like to uh, just to state that uh, as uh, all crises, uh, the COVID-19 also represents an opportunity Unity. And one of things uh, that was uh, revealed by the crisis uh, is uh, uh, the fragilities and weaknesses of the entrepreneurial ecosystem, uh, actually at, at a global level and also at a national levels. And uh, one of such weaknesses on which actually Jungtat was working for many years, but again was very much stressed and put on the spot, uh, 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 is the lack of coherence and holistic approach uh, to um, uh, to entrepreneurship promotion, entrepreneurship policies, reflecting also a cross-cutting nature of entrepreneurship per se. So that next slide, please. So uh, in this regard, uh, um, uh, just uh, again wanted to bring it to attention of participants uh, that Jungtat for many years, it actually was in the beginning of uh, uh, 2000, uh, uh, the, the second decade of uh, 2000, uh, that we started to work on the document which is called Entrepreneurship Policy Framework, uh, which we launched in 2012, where we really try to address this issue of uh, 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 lack of uh, coherence and holistic approach, as I already mentioned, to promote entrepreneurship policies uh, uh, to facilitate uh, impact and contribution to development, also to the SDG implementation, and now uh, as well uh, to the post-COVID-19 recovery. So you can here see this, uh, you, you can see here the uh, uh, the, um, uh, the table, uh, the, the picture that shows, uh, reflects this, uh, uh, the need for holistic approach to entrepreneurship uh, and uh, incorporating into the uh, consideration of uh, how entrepreneurship ecosystem ecosystem should be built, uh, key components including the regulatory environment, entrepreneurship education and skills, innovation and technology exchange, improve of access to finance, access to markets, and also raise awareness and networking. So I think all these components were already mentioned by Dr. Uh, Budiarso. And uh, so this is also very, very interesting to see how all this is aligned uh, uh, within what uh, uh, have been also promoted by, uh, uh, by Jungtat. And again, I want to stress here that's really one of our key issues and also key success factors to ensure this, uh, cross, uh, to ensure this uh, coherent approach and coordination between different approaches, uh, different components and uh, as well as the whole of government approach, which involves actually different uh, entities, different ministries that are involved in or, uh, or leading promoting of these different components. Also a uh, consideration of the local context, because of course, uh, uh, one size does not fit, fit all. Then the synergies between the, uh, the components, which again would be uh, ensured through the coordination between different uh, uh, um, entities that deal with these different components. So, and then of course, the uh, multi-stakeholder engagement, meaning that it's really very important to involve private sector as well, uh, to hear their voices, to understand what are their needs better, especially in the local content. And also uh, with uh, this uh, um, approach that is uh, highlighted by UN and other agencies on building back better to have an inclusive approach and also to facilitate inclusive uh, green and uh, um, uh, resilient uh, recovery, a circular recovery as well uh, in these uh, uh, efforts uh, to facilitate resurgence of the SME sector and uh, enhancement of the role of the SME se uh, sector in this resurgence. Next slide, please. So uh, uh, through the implementation of the EPF and through other activities that we have, we came up with a few uh, aspects that are really key uh, to promote entrepreneurship. Again, for the sake of time, I wouldn't really have, uh, uh, you know, I cannot pay too much of uh, 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 time to uh, each of those. But again, would like to stress the need for this holistic approach, stronger coordination between all stakeholders and components, also the lack of data, which is really very important to uh, build the strategy and measures uh, to identi identify gaps and also to decide on priorities. And for this uh, data is really needed to see what needs to be done and also to assess the impact. Uh, digitalization, of course, was mentioned because it now became a cross-cutting aspect through all components, uh, but also the, uh, uh, the quality of uh, human resources, which also was mentioned uh, in the previous pre uh, presentation 
facilitation. And here, I would like to mention two aspects of that. One is, of course, the facilitation of technical skills, financial inclusion, access to finance, accounting. Uh, this is really a key aspect, uh, especially in uh, recovery and access to financial aid. And we can discuss more on that because it's also one of aspects that we do at UNCTAD uh, in, in the enterpri enterprise branch, uh, but also the mindset, you know, the changing of mindset and creating of new entrepreneurial culture. And uh, uh, in this regard, I would like to, uh, 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 to, to draw your attention to the program of Empratech. And uh, so then we are really very fortunate today uh, to have director of our most advanced uh, Empratech Center from Uganda and also a beneficiary of Empratech services, Amala, who uh, would explain uh, her experience with Empratech. But just as an introduction, few things uh, that, you know, M what is Empratech? Basically, it's, uh, it comes from a, a, a acronym of uh, two uh, uh, Spanish words, emprendedores and technology. So which means technology of uh, entrepreneur, uh, inter, um, entrepreneurs uh, development. It's technology how to develop successful entrepreneurs. And uh, uh, the differentiator for the Empratech uh, uh, compared vis a vis other uh, very good entrepreneurial uh, promotion programs is that Empratech is based on behavioral approach. So, and uh, so then uh, it's really quite a big uh, undertaking that we have at UCTAD. Uh, next slide, please, uh, uh, Chanteline. So it's, uh, it's in existence since uh, 1988. So for now we have roots in more than 50 countries and we actually have some roots in Indonesia and we can again uh, discuss a little bit more on that, but we don't have the center while uh, normally we will uh, promote and, and protect through uh, 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 working, cooperating or even establishing a national and protect center that would promote this uh, methodology and to which uh, to, to the centers we transfer the Empratech uh, methodology per se. So uh, that we have really quite an impressive geography. Next slide, please. So here is an Empratec uh, map. Uh, you could see that very presented in all continents. And uh, one of uh, key uh, uh, signs of uh, the uh, success of the program uh, is its data on statistics. Next slide, please. So here, just very briefly, uh, some of uh, uh, these are, uh, this is the case of Brazil. Uh, of course, we have other cases as well, but I would like to uh, draw your attention here that uh, even uh, getting jobs after Empratech, which is of course Empratech is about facilitation of new businesses, but even if job creation and access to new jobs uh, is one of uh, impacts that we see through the Empratech installation. Next slide, please. So uh, due, uh, due, due, due to this impact and uh, long existence, uh, uh, Empratech was specifically highlighted in the uh, two uh, uh, last resolutions of uh, General Assembly, uh, which are called Entrepreneurship for Sustainable Development. So uh, in two resolutions of 2018 and 2020, due to this high impact and uh, uh, all this uh, coverage that I mentioned, Empratech is specifically highlighted as a program uh, based on behavioral approach and as an impactful program to facilitate entrepreneurship promotion. So uh, uh, we normally say, next slide, please, that uh, 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 there are four uh, that there are four use four use uh, in the entrepreneurship program. It is unleashing of entrepreneurship potential. It's un unique because it's based on unique Harvard methodology. It's really a very scientific approach that's behind the Empratech methodology. It's also universal. So you could see here that we have really a vast variety of uh, uh, target groups uh, for entrepreneurship promotion. But uh, in regard to these discussions, I want to highlight that we also have a success in creative industries in Angola. And uh, since we're talking about these really dozens of millions uh, of uh, uh, SMEs and micro enterprises and cooperatives uh, in Indonesia, normally we find that this target audience would also represent uh, audience with low literacy. And we actually have a sub product uh, to deal with entrepreneurship promotion based on behavioral approach, but for to be delivered for people with a low literacy. And it's also uniting because we have uh, more than 40 centers. We have roots in more than 50 countries, but in more than 40 of them, we have employed tech centers and we uh, really look forward maybe uh, with an interest uh, from Indonesian authorities uh, to also uh, uh, have Empratech uh, Center in uh, Indonesia. So that's why next slide play, play, uh, please. Uh, so we say that Empratech is for you so it's really for you uh, join Empratech and we're really very happy to uh, cooperate. So then as a concluding, uh, uh, and I'm really careful about the time, I want to say that uh, uh, these, um, you know, both the policy work, 
uh, entrepreneurship and pre-tech work as well, uh, but also what was mentioned before uh, and in, in, in previous representation and uh, in, in what UNCTAD is doing, you know, the area of technical skills like, like as financial inclusion would be something that we can uh, bring uh, add value to. Uh, and uh, uh, I also mentioned about, or already mentioned about and protect per se, but I also want to say that uh, we had a request uh, from two years ago from, um, uh, from uh, Indonesian authorities about and protect. Unfortunately, we didn't have the funding for this. So uh, with uh, some uh, additional things that we uh, see uh, and support to SME development, uh, first of all, through the uh, UN wide uh, project, which is called Global Initiative uh, towards uh, uh, SME research uh, towards post-COVID resurgence in the SME sector, where we have a number of activities at a global level, so that really could facilitate uh, some, uh, you know, communication and outreach uh, uh, with authorities in Indonesia and also uh, beneficiaries, uh, entrepreneurs and small businesses. But we also have another project coming in uh, next year, which is a uh, international um, uh, um, uh, national financial financing frameworks where we do have a component for indonesia for a pilot and protect workshop but also a component on financial literacy so we recently developed a specific tool uh, which is accounting for micro entrepreneurs which is a simplified approach to accounting records we're also developing an e-platform uh, to uh, facilitate uh, 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 creating of uh, financial reports or financial statements for micro entrepreneurs to facilitate their access to finance. And here we're really very happy to, uh, uh, to, to continue our communication and to see how we can put our efforts together uh, to actually promote and move uh, in these uh, three areas on policies, uh, on them protect or say, and also financial literacy. Thank you so much. And uh, so we look forward to our cooperation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tatiana. And indeed, um, as you all know, the socioeconomic response to COVID-19 of the Secretary General of the UN does include a focus on, so on the uh, MSMEs. And um, within the network of economists at uh, the UN, UNCTAD has been promoting the not only a green recovery, but a green, a purple, a orange recovery so that we do include the creative economy, the care economy, and all those economies, the blue economy as well. Um, so without further ado, and thank you so much, Tatiana, for this, I'm, I'm honored to introduce uh, Charles Oksesi, I hope I say that right, uh, Executive Director of the Enterprise Uganda, which is one of the 43 Empretech centers uh, with whom that Tatiana mentioned, uh, that is doing fantastic work in Uganda. So um, Mr. Ocheti, you have the floor. We love to hear from you. Thank you so much, Chant uh, Chantal. And uh, I'm so happy to be talking after Tatiana has just given you a background about the Empretech program. Uh, Uganda is privileged to be a host of the program and we have been hosting the program since 2001. And I'm just going to illustrate the power of Empretech and then later give one of our beneficiaries the floor to share her own journey in this game. Um, as Tatiana put it, entrepreneurship is really a cross-cutting tool for bringing out economic empowerment of communities, empowering countries, and creating competitiveness of different economies. And if you want even your financial solutions to deepen and diversify, again, it has to be backed by a very highly vibrant private sector. So I want to start with a an example of a young man whom we brought onto the Empretech program uh, when he was just in his final year at the university. After he attended our training, this young man went without getting any shilling or any resources again from any other person other than his reformed mindset. And a mindset which said, with the resources that I have, I'm going to start right there. And literally what he did, he just relied on his own energy his own commitment and desire to achieve and transform his own future. A young man who was born to a family of a single mother of seven children and with limited resources and a mother with hardly any income, today is having the following kind of income. And he has been earning this income even during the COVID times. He is making sales of $100,000 every 30 days. What is he selling? He's selling fish from fish farms in the communities where he grew up from. But now he's also beginning to get fish supplied 
from different farmers in different parts of the country. So the young man is exporting fish equivalent to $100,000 per month. And the net profit from those operations, according to him, is 15%. That's about $15,000 per month, a young man of 29 years. A young man who had no income, who had no hope, and who had completely no contacts and no networks. But he comes, he attends this protect program, and his mind is opened, and he discovers that when it comes to business, the, the territory is open to everyone. But you've got to have the right mindset to be able to deliver solutions that the market will be continuing to buy. But two, as the market continues to buy from you, you'll be attracting competition. You must be ready to compete with a very resourced, the very finest, the most um, capable employers in terms of uh, farms that come and compete with you. So this young man has got a staff complement today of 51. And of the 51 staff that he has, four of them are graduates. And he has even appreciated the power of employing a young lady as an internal auditor because he said, you know what, when it comes to money and when you are so busy, the best person you need to bring in is a female internal auditor. So I bring this story in just to tell you that entrepreneurship, when it is properly delivered, well-structured, it becomes a differentiator. It also becomes an equalizer, no matter your background. So when Tatiana was sharing the, the, the four use of entrepreneurship, I just loved the four use and I said, yes, indeed, when it comes to entrepreneurship, it's universal. It's unique because it has ability to touch as many people as possible. Female, male, young, old, people with no resources in the beginning. Like now, this young man is attractive to banks. On his own accord, he's attractive to banks. But the banks are saying, we're well, looking at your bank account. You look attractive. Can we finance for you some of your own needs? And he has financed some three cold storage trucks that he uses for transporting is a fish. But I also want to say something about entrepreneurship when it's properly done. When you do it well, it not just does it create micro, small, and medium scale enterprises. It actually creates dynamic micro, small, and medium scale ent entrepreneurs. In other words, somebody who was micro two years ago, two years later, they will be small. Whoever was small, two years later, will be medium size. Whoever was medium size will be an exporter and a big global player. So when you do entrepreneurship so well, it gives what I call a seedbed for creating transformers in the economy. When you listen to the next speaker who is coming from Uganda, Julian is a beneficiary of our Empretec program. What she has done, she has ended up attracting the attention of the country. And the nation has gone to work with her, not because they were beg she was begging to be, to be just getting the government to join her. The government simply said, what you are doing is what we have been trying to do on our own for a long time and failing. Now that you are doing it, can we see how we can join you and create a much transformative effect of creating effective entrepreneurs? And I bring this example behind, before I bring about what government should do, because there are many efforts everywhere today across the globe of governments, individuals, institutions, NGOs trying to create entrepreneurs. But as you try to create entrepreneurs, it is a good thing to provide them with financial resources. It's a good thing to give them even some inputs. But much more important beyond anything else is the business mindset, the entrepreneurial culture that Tatiana referred to. That mindset is what holds this fellow long-term in the game because wherever you put into the private sector, they don't have an exclusive market. They are playing in a market where people with the cheapest resources are also allowed to play in. They are playing in a market where people with the best technology are also allowed to play in. There's no exclusive market for micro or for young people or for women. There's just a market for buyers and sellers. So what am I driving at here? I'm driving, driving at a message which says that if you want to get it right and know that you are now creating a valuable intervention through entrepreneurship, you need to see dynamism in the private sector of the nation. The fellows who are micro should become small. The small should become medium. The medium should become large and create value chains 
that continue to lift the rest of the economy out of poverty. So what are then some of the things that I could give as takeaways for governments? Number one is that uh, we as government leaders should accept that not everyone can be an expert or an advisor on the game of entrepreneurship. It's easy to say, go and start a business, go and join a welding industry. It is easy to announce those things. And whenever you announce them as a leader, the young people or anybody who is listening to you might think it's as easy as just going and getting started because they gave you a bit of resources. But to remain there, you need a very structured program that delivers entrepreneurship in its holiness, in its holistic manner, and delivers a lasting solution. Number two, uh, government should avoid what I call short-term outlook to enterprise development. You are about to go into elections. What do you do? You begin distributing some microcredit or even distributing some inputs and calling it that you are empowering you. That is short-term. In the short-term, it may look like you are doing a great thing, but long-term, you, if you go and check on the same people three, four, five months later, even a year later, they are not there because you didn't give them the roots of entrepreneurship. Number three, it is important that whoever is trying to create entrepreneurs should look for models and inspiration or lessons from already existing players or entrepreneurs in a given economy. The story of Julian that you'll hear now, it should be a story that Uganda should have went, gone deep and researched on and found out why did Julian who came from modest education, modest family background, become such a mega industrialist, such a mega farmer. So it is important to realize that when it comes to entrepreneurship, as governments, as leaders, let us not just imagine that we are the first to go into this space. Somebody is doing it. Check those women who are in banking, who are already in banking on their own accord. How did they start? Check on the young man who is into a bank and the bank is giving him credit. How did he get to that game? Because those kind of lessons are the lessons you want to borrow from to create a lasting uh, entrepreneurship program. But also you need to revisit the definition of success in business as a government. Success of definition, the, the, the definition of success in business should not just be, oh, I gave people startup capital and this number got the money. When they got the startup capital, did they start enterprises? Did the enterprises deliver the solutions? Did those solutions give them the kind of rewards that are transforming their lives? That is a much better yardstick for assessing the success in business of any program. Even writing business plans can be written by anybody, but the moment you write that document, then what? How far did it transform the person who benefited from the document? In effect, as I conclude, my message is clear. To create enduring entrepreneurs, you need an institutional approach. An approach that recognizes that one, an entrepreneur is built across years. It is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Number two, an entrepreneur can never be built by just one entity. You need bankers, you need financial advisors, you need people who encourage quality aspects. All these institutions should collaborate and result in creating an ecosystem that creates an entrepreneur that will cross different barriers and cross with their heads up. I want to leave it there for now and really be so grateful that we could be part of this as Uganda. Thank you so much, Tatiana, and thank you, Ch Ch Chantal, and all the participants in this meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charles, and, and for your passion uh, for, for entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. Uh, it comes true very clearly. And uh, clearly, you've been doing this for a while, so you know what you're talking about. And we appreciate your, your recommendation. Indeed, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon, and maybe an ultra marathon, <laughs> for that matter, when we look at the, the, the journey that Julianne went through. So let me add it. I'm delighted to uh, introduce Julianne Omala. She's the founder and chief executive of, director of Delight Uganda Limited. <laughs> Um, and she is one of the foremost uh, East Africa's uh, entrepreneurs. And we are very proud of Antad. She was one of the finalists during the seventh edition of Antad and Protect Women in Business Awards. Um, and she won the, the special prize category dedicated to women entrepreneurs empowering other women through inclusive business and award category that is sponsored by uh, GIZ. 
And so I'm not going to say more because uh, this woman is so impressive. The work that she does is so wonderful. I had the uh, the chance to be able to read uh, on on her background. So, Julian, you have the screen. Please tell us how do we how do you become so successful, <laughs> and what do you need from government and other national organization to make it even better, and other women can do what you do. Uh, thanks so much. All protocols observed. Um, I really want to thank Ankita for empowering me and for training me to be a good leader. I'm proud of Enterprise Uganda, Mr. Charles Ochichi. Uh, I'm what I am because I'm a woman who has been empowered, supported, and uh, my dream, I can say since 1996, was to work with the community, especially the informal sector. How my dream was how can I organize them into production groups so that everybody can work, everybody can produce, everybody can support themselves. And I'm so happy that I'm realizing my dream because since 1996, my dream was to make fresh juice from the fresh fruits and to work with the informal sector. Those one who are not valued, those who are there depending on the donors because the community I work with, they suffer during Kony War and they did, not, they, they did not grow up in family setup. They missed the formal education. But I said, yes, I can create value from those people. So I went to Noya. We bought land, we 1,700 acres. We started um, with the nursery. We raised the seedlings, the right varieties we needed. We started the orchard. We started uh, the Delight Farm Institute. After realizing our challenges we had in the farm, we said the only way is to start the Farm Institute, which will skill the informal sector on how to do it. And we also said we need that Farm Institute, which will bring the professional, the academician to come and download what they have in their brain to the practitioners, the former sector who did not get a chance to go to school and we practice and so that together we can produce volumes and the quality of good fruits for process of juice production, for parup and for dry mangoes. Then we looked at how can we be successful? The only thing we realized is to work with government, to work with development partners, and to work with the professionals. After setting up a center of excitement for learning and doing, because our village farm institute, it was the only institute in operation during COVID-19, even during the lockdown. Because for us, we would work in community, we train the younger people, we train the women on how to do it. And after showing them how to do it, now we have a complete value chain of fruits. Realizing that if fruits takes time to grow and we are setting a factory, actually we agreed with the Uganda government after the award, they said they are going to invest a processing plant in the region. So we realized that what can we do to get quick money to come out of poverty? We developed different value chain, the one for fruits and the one for cereals and one for oil seeds. For oil seeds, we process and make the peanut butter the OD, and we have the market. We have those who are in cereals. We, we have a common user facility built by Naro. Now we are gathering the, the, the cereals and we pack. So we looked at the value of having the complete value chain and supporting them, the different actors. We have those who are in the nursery, those who are in production, those who are in marketing, those who are in value addition, all of those competitive, those very chain actors need to be supported. And when they are supported, that means there will be money in the community. There will be money for the, like the women, those informal sectors also to work for themselves and support themselves. And you know, for us as women, when we have not going to school and we have no money, we have no problems, we have no projects, you find that we are voiceless. But because everybody is working and everybody is supported, everybody has a plan and everybody is working. And that was my dream. How can we work together as a private sector and as government also come and work with us and development partners? My humble request is development partners need to support those sectors which are well organized, 
well coordinated so that they can work better. Also, as entrepreneurs, we also get some challenges. Yes, there is what we can do better, but to have a very good model and where you involve so many people, different stakeholders, we need professionalism. That's why we need the government to come in and the development partners and support us with the technical team to come and put structures and systems in place. So that as an entrepreneur, when you start your project, it should be there and live and support many. I'm always proud of our Delight Farm Institute because it is the only institute training the informal sector. And in Uganda, almost 70% are the informal sector. Majority have not gone to school. Others, the people we are working with, are the youth. The youth, the jobless graduates, we have so many. We have the, the those who have never gone to school. We even have the younger mothers. We have a lot of refugees in Uganda, especially in Northern Uganda. Uganda, we are so kind and generous. We have donated the land to the refugees. But now I'm trying to work with you and women. How do we match the refugees and the hosting community. What we are doing as data in Uganda to mobilize the hosting community to avoid land. And we also get the, the refugees and we merge them together so that they work together for the one common goal to produce. And then we look at government to come in and build that big factory and also development partners to come and support us so that we can support the informal sector. As a woman, I have, I know my challenges. I know the challenges of other women. So when I'm supported, when I'm empowered, I will empower better those women at the grassroots and I help them to do, especially like on the mindset chain. There are those refugees who believe that already they are foreigners, they are refugees, they can't do much, but they are sources of production, they are sources of labor. If we engage them and they produce, they produce, they will become the future billionaires. To me, I sincerely believe that we should ensure that we work together under public-private partnership so that for us as entrepreneurs, we can do our part, organize ourselves, and we do our part what we can do better. But where we need support, government needs to come in and support us. And also development partners needs to come in and support us, pick us where we are, we go to another level. Because like me, I have a big dream. Yes, I do as much as I can as a, I have to manage my business, as Dila Uganda Limited Company, I have to manage Dila Farm Institute, I have to manage the, the community, and I'm also a chairperson of Noya Fruit Growers Cooperative Society. We started with two members, now we went to 5,000, now we are having 11,000 members. Now um, I'm supposed also to go to other districts where we are having the refugees, as I, as I mentioned. I have to seek land user rights because the women in Uganda, they don't have land, but we beg the husbands to give us the land user rights so that the women can do their projects in that land and also bring in their friends as refugees so that people can work, people can be busy instead of waiting for donors or government to be dependent on others. Me, I believe that God created us with the brain, with the hand, we only needed to be pushed to another to produce and also what we can't afford. We look at government, we look at our development partners, because me, I believe that we can. If you come out to Uganda, we have a lot of land. You find one person end owning 10,000 acres of land. Why can't you chop up that land? Give to the refugees, instead of sitting or drinking and producing, let them also be engaged in massive production so that together we can come out of property. Thank you. Julian, that's so powerful. And I just want to repeat the numbers. Uh, 11,000 members organizing cooperatives. They each have small, like an acre each, producing fruits. Um, the statistics, I don't know if this is the latest, Julian, 1,850, 1,850 seasonally that they can make each of these women from that one acre. And um, Julian buys the fruit from them. She has a centers of excellence. And now the Ugandan government, because of the work that she does, something a government can't do at the federal level. She basically organizes these small producers. She buys them, she trains them from the center of excellence. 
and then basically buy their fruit. And then um, the government has invested eight million um, grant. She's get given eight million grant from to basically build a processing juice processing factory. And so instead of importing the juice, the frozen juice from outside the country. The, the fruits are produced and now they can be processed. This is structural transformation that all government wants to see happening. And it's happening from a, a micro company that became a, big, a medium, as you said, Charles, that became a large company that can now have a large impact. And not for only the rich, but for the, the, the refugees, the youth without job, the women without education. And this is truly structural transformation. Julian, that's amazing. Did, did you want to intervene? Otherwise, what I'd like to do is I'd like to go to Ola Yinka because she's from the Caribbean. She's doing great work on creative economy. And then I feel like there's going to be some powwow coming out of this discussion because um, we have such powerful um, people experience from the entrepreneurs, the trainers, and the governments here and the international organization, of course. So um, if we could go to um, our last but definitely not the least uh, speaker, Ms. Olayinka Jacobs Bunnik is the founder of South South Heart and Culture Collective in Jamaica. She's the, um, and she is an enterprise and cultural development leader with 19 years international experience in designing and implementing impact led social and cultural action programs. Uh, she leads change and transformation to innovation, creative concept, and beneficiary engagement using digital first approach. So as you can see, we've talked about digital inclusiveness, we've talked about creative, we've talked about um, collective and engagement. So Ola Yinka, bring all this together for us, please. You have the, the screen. Thank you so much. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here today. I'm coming to you from Jamaica. And um, just before I get started with my presentation, I all protocols observed, uh, thank you for having me, but I would really like to uh, commend the government of Indonesia on the fantastic numbers um, that you have shared with us. You clearly have a business climate to be envied. <laughs> if 99.9% .9 of your um, economy is based on MSMEs, you're definitely doing something right. So that's that's quite quite wonderful. Um, and also to my colleagues in Uganda, uh, Julia, I've read your story before. <laughs> so now I know, now <laughs> it's interesting to meet you in person, albeit virtually. Um, Charles, thank you so much for sharing some very important points there. And uh, Tatiana, Empretech, very interesting. I couldn't see the map properly, but I think there isn't one in the English speaking Caribbean. So I am definitely throwing our hat in the ring there. Um, I would like to share my screen, if I may. Um, can I do that? I think it should be You fine. should be able to, if you click the share screen. Do you have the green share screen at the bottom of your screen? Um, yeah. Okay, so if you click on that. There we go, that should work. There we go. Okay, so my presentation today is going to be very much um, focused on, you know, the practical sides of things. Um, as Chantelaine said, I have been working in this industry now 20 years, um, and I've been working in the field for 20 years, and I um, am, amongst other things, uh, an accredited business advisor. So I have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to supporting businesses. Uh, I do have a specialization in creative and cultural industries and enterprise development for this sector. But at the end of the day, one of the most important things for us to remember always is that irrespective of the sector, um, <clears throat> we are a business and creative entrepreneurs are also businesses. Now, just something very quickly about the South-South Collective. This is, um, as one of my colleagues has said to me, the work of my heart. Um, the South South Collective is an organization that I founded two years ago, um, mainly out of frustration <laughs> um, with not being able to, with not seeing the types of, the type of support and uh, policies or opportunities in place for uh, the creative and cultural industries to thrive, not only in the Caribbean, but across the global South. Um, and the pandemic actually, uh, has created an unprecedented platform for our sector. Uh, one of the key issues that we face um, 
globally is that you know is the value the value of creative and and, and cultural products um and i think our value has been more than um under highlighted through the pandemic so the South South Collective collaborates with partners and organizations worldwide to create business to business opportunities, not a business to consumer uh, nonprofit, but we create business to business opportunities for Global South artists, creative producers and cultural professionals to connect, collaborate and convene. So these, as simple as they may sound, are really on a practical point, from a practical point of view, some of the deficits that exist within the creative and cultural industry sector, particularly in the global south. Um, and UNESCO has done a lot of work on, as well as, as UNTAD, on um, artist mobility. Uh, and, you know, if we can't, if we can't move in between countries, uh, in, um, not, it's not easy, but it has to be the type of movement that facilitates business growth, then um, as a creative sector, we cannot continue to grow. Collaboration is absolutely central to the growth of the creative economy. Um, it is central to the growth of any business um, and majority of the uh, primary sectors across uh, the global south and the world have opportunities to collaborate with businesses outside of their geographic locations, um, it's a little more difficult for the creative sector. Now, just before um, you know, we get started, just before I actually look at uh, some of the recommendations that I have for um, you know, effective stimulus policies, I wanted us to just take a, take a few minutes to look at what and why. So, you know, what is the role or the importance of, of the creative economy, which, which has been really um, spoken about already, so I won't spend too much time on that. But why should we be supporting it? Um, so creative cities. So creative cities are really, cities in general are really the undisputed engines for innovation and growth. And vibrant creative cities are central to the COVID-19 recovery. The majority of our creative and cultural production happens in cities. So a citywide policy that includes stimulus packages for the creative and cultural industries is an extremely important element uh, that we cannot overlook. Um, cities are where change is happening the fastest. 2% of the world's land mass um, is in cities. Um, cities are where innovation happens to help us cope with some of the challenges that they create, their economic powerhouses, cultural and artistic centers, and technical hubs. Um, and historically, there are many, many examples of cities that have perished or failed because they have been left to the devices of the market or technical forces, or they were reliant on pre one predominant mode of production, such as mining and agriculture. So the creative city is a city that creates opportunities for innovation. Um, innovation to deal with some of the issues that have arisen because of COVID-19, but also innovation to deal with some of our primary sectors. The majority of our cities are not conducive to the work of the creative and cultural economy for very simple reasons, which I will share a bit later. The total population of our urban areas will reach 6.3 billion by 2050. That's 68 percent of the world's population. And the quality of life needs to be high so that cities can compete and thrive. We need the creative and cultural economy to be central to that. Successful creative cities provide the infrastructure and the ecosystems to innovate, solve and enhance the quality of life of its citizens. And we can do that through creative clusters. Now, creative clusters is not a new concept. It's something that's been around since the 90s, um, the early 90s. Uh, and but there are very few cities who have, at least in the global south, have successfully managed to create um, to uh, develop creative clusters, particularly within the uh, within their cities. Um, but why are creative clusters important? Um, you know, a lot of us don't actually realize 
that uh, money follows creativity. So hence my slide there, follow the money. That's basically what it is. It's about following the money. Um, a 2016 study by the Martin Prosperity Institute, Rise of the Global Startup City, noted that two thirds of global venture capital investment centers are located in only 20 metropolitan areas. And what do they all have in common, these metropolitan areas? They are creative cities. So we have, for example, San Francisco, which is the home to Silicon Valley, Boston, New York, Beijing, Shanghai, Mumbai, um, you know, Pixar in Mumbai, you have uh, Disney India, Pixar Animation Bollywood, Bangalore, etc. All clusters of innovation and creativity. Universities are also an important part of a creative city and a creative cluster, um, simply because they are the beds of innovation. So think of the role of Stanford University um, in the rise of Silicon Valley. So the creative and cultural industries, when we're thinking about policies, national policies and regional policies, we really have to situate it within a context. And that context I would like to advance is the citywide context. So if you, so you cannot really envision uh, stimulus packages or stimulus policies unless you envision a city with creative clusters. Um, as I said, it's not a new concept. There are many examples around the world. So what needs to change? Um, now, we have heard about this from our other speakers, access to finance, access to inter information, access to networks, access to support. As a business advisor, these are the areas of work and someone who's working in enterprise development. These are the four key drivers that are repetitive. So these are the four areas where constantly over the two past two and a half decades of my work, um, we see gaps. OK, so a lot of our access to finance policies and um, opportunities that are presented by governments uh, put the creative economy at a disadvantage because we're basically handing out a begging bowl. And we need to stop that. We need to look at the creative economy and the creative sector as a productive sector, as an asset and not a liability. So one of the examples that I've given here of access to finance is percentage for art. So this encourages art in the built environment by mandating that a percentage of development's overall budget of the development's overall budget is allocated to commission art on new public buildings. It's very simple, but it positions the creative business as an asset rather than a liability. Um, other examples of this um, where the creative economy is being positioned as an asset. In Bangladesh, for example, governments are buying work from the artists. This is during the COVID recovery period. Romania providing loans and subsidizing interest for the loans in the creative economy. Tax reductions for the purchase um, of works of art. Companies that buy original works of art by living artists for public display or musical instruments intended for loan to artists may under certain conditions deduct the purchase price from their taxable income. That's another very practical way um, of looking at the creative economy. And all of this you will see is extremely important. Um, our colleagues from Indonesia spoke about public education. Well, if you're you have to communicate on all fronts when it comes to public education, including in this way looking at the creative economy as um, an asset rather than a liability, which is traditionally in the global south how we have been perceived. Um, you know, you kind of get into arts and culture when you're not good at math and English or you can't be a lawyer or a doctor. We need to cut that out. That needs to stop now. We have proven our worth a hundred times over during the pandemic. Another really interesting area um, in the access to finance is blockchain. Now, a lot of people tend to confuse blockchain with um, cryptocurrency, but a blockchain is really a public ledger. And one of the issues that we have seen um, with creative collaboration and in the creative industries, and even in terms of growth of the businesses, is how do we protect our IP? IP is our collateral, but how can we prove that it's ours? 
blockchain is a really great opportunity to do this because you can go through and you can actually upload and list and get certified for each part of your process. So this is something that has been happening in Germany for the past five years or so. Um, it is being currently introduced in the Middle East by a colleague partner organization of ours. And we're in discussions with them to see how we can actually introduce that in our region. Uh, this is really one of the key areas in terms of policy that we need to look at. How do we ensure that IPS collateral is widely accepted? It's still misunderstood, it's still not accepted, but it is a value added that uh, works. And this is, and through blockchain, you can track it and trace it. So those are some just very practical uh, solutions that both governments and international organizations and charities can actually work together um, on. Access to information, believe it or not, although we may have overload, information overload now, most MSMEs, and this is really, really not limited to the creative sector, they're actually not aware of the different um, types of support and opportunities that are available to them. Um, you know, they depend on people like, like us, uh, business advisors, to have that information, but we need to democratize the information. It needs to stop being in a professional ghetto of, you know, with people and individuals who have access to it. Um, and with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, it makes it so much easier. The question is, how do we make that information accessible to the right people at the right time so that they know exactly how to utilize it for their benefit? So access to information is still an issue within the creative and cultural sector. Um, and this, can I can ask you to, to wrap up, please. We have um, seven minutes, maybe, okay. left to oh, this sorry. session. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so just going through very quickly, access to networks, content management and support ecosystem approach. Um, <clears throat> something that the government of Indonesia is implementing, but ecosystem approach in itself um, is something that is, means that the creative, creative economy is not a priority sector, but a part of a whole. So, you know, how do we actually get to this point where there are just some basic fundamentals, and I'm going to end with this status of the artist reform. Now, we can put all these wonderful policies in place and have all these great ideas, but if we don't have a legislated policy that looks at, that actually looks at improvement in the state of artists, cultural producers, and cultural workers, reducing their precarity, artist displacement, and economic leakage, then none of it is going to work. None of it will be sustainable. We need to, that is the root of the tree. Status of the artist reform needs to be something central to any policy making. Creative and cultural literacy, again, I spoke about public awareness. We have to shift consumer and stakeholder perception of the value of art and culture. Digital infrastructure. Many of us across the global south don't have physical enough physical infrastructure, but digital infrastructure. Develop and implement national and regional frameworks to enable cultural and creative brands to manage their value chains digitally and digitize their processes through process mapping. This is currently happening here in the Caribbean, um, mainly in Trinidad um, and other Eastern Caribbean countries. But so really, it's just very simple and practical things that we haven't thought about um, because the creative economy is still, and the creative industries are still perceived as liabilities and not assets. So that's the mind shift that needs to happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ola Yinka. And uh, you're speaking to the right crowd here. As you know, Indonesia as a country has been leading the uh, the, the effort worldwide on uh, recognizing the creative economy and uh, having accepted at the UN the International Day of Creative Economy. Um, um, so I think this was fantastic, but I want to open the floor to questions. If you have questions, please put that in the chat or uh, I have a gallery view. I'll try to see if you raise your hand. Um, there's so much richness here, um, and the digital economy is coming back uh, strongly. Protection, I like this idea of the IP for artists um, and, and using the stimulus packages to specifically target um, the creative economy. Um, the floor is open. May I perhaps ask... Um, our co-organizer, Dr. Um, Prabowo and uh, Burt Diasso, Diasso, if you have comments or questions uh, from what has been said. 
Thank you, Sundar. Uh, I would like to actually have uh, two comments. First, uh, my question to Tatiana. Yeah, we really uh, would like to know more about Emperor Teke. Probably Indonesia can learn as well. You mentioned that there is potential to have a cooperation in, in with Indonesia. Uh, we're quite open to discuss further. Yeah. And my second question with regard to the creative industry, Olenka, uh, I think your presentation is quite uh, amazing. Uh, I just really, uh, you know, are quite fascinating the way you uh, address this through city development. Uh, in terms of the digital era, uh, do you think that the digitalization can also play such kind of a trigger for uh, developing uh, more uh, creative yeah, in terms of the youngsters, especially, or uh, when uh, with regard to the previous uh, speaker as well about women, Indonesia is quite, uh, when I mentioned 99.9%, because in Indonesia we have 75 islands, which is we are quite very diverse to very, very big city metropolitan, and we also very, very remote area. So what do you think we can try to uh, introduce uh, the smart city or creative city and digitalization to embrace towards more uh, kind of remote area? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Budasio. Uh, let me go to uh, Vita Noviandi, please. You have the floor quickly because we're running out of time. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Vita Noviandi. I'm from Mofa, Indonesia, from the capital. Uh, actually, I'm very interested in the Empretec program uh, explained by uh, Ms. Tatiana. Um, is it possible uh, if Angtut uh, will explain the Empretec program in more detail, maybe in another uh, session? Uh, I think we want to uh, connect the Empretec with the uh, uh, related uh, ministry here in, uh, in from the capital. And, uh, I also heard about uh, some project was uh, were delayed because or postponed because of uh, there's no funding for the program. Um, what will Angtet do with the country? I mean, will Angtet help the country to find a donor or or other way? Uh, can you a little bit explain about that because? I'm a little bit uh, new about the uh, program and, and how Angtet works. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vienti. Um, I don't see any, no other hands. Um, so I think what I'm gonna do, and Yvonne, do we have a few minutes we can uh, still to get answers? I hope we can. Yes, of course. Yes, thank you. So let me start, but with you, Ola Yinka, specific question, how do we use big cities? Indonesia has a lot of big cities, but also rural areas. How do, you, how do we do that practically? Thanks so much. Um, so practically speaking, um, you know, one of well, one of the issues that we that we have at least here in the, in, uh, in Jamaica specifically, I don't know what it's the same in Indonesia, is internet connectivity. So yes, you can use digital um, to encourage and support the growth of youth entrepreneurship, um, but you also have to think about some of the barriers to access. So the barriers to access for most young people is money. So can they afford to buy the data? Can, do they have access to locations where they can actually um, get on the internet? Do they even have um, you know, um, devices? Um, so you know, the creative city is a digital city, yes. But one of the discussions raging in the community is, can we ever replace face-to-face? Uh, I think collectively we believe in the creative in the creative community that we can never replace face to face, and this is where the tourism element is really interesting. Um, but there are many ways to actually, for example, utilize, you know, digital in tourism. Um, in in a discussion that I had a few months ago, um, one of the, an artist put forward the opportunity to do virtual tours, which has already started. But a lot of us in um, in our uh, global South communities are not using digital in this way. So, and he was speaking about virtual reality tours, not simply click, clicking onto the internet and um, having a look at what's happening. So he was saying, you know, well, our tourism sector has shut down. Why can't we use virtual reality to invite people to still be a part of what of um, our communities here? Um, and that, in the interim, 
um, you know, will replace face to face. But in terms of young people and digitization, yes, absolutely is one of the fastest ways to reach them, one of the best ways to incentivize them. But we absolutely have to think about the barriers to access. Um, and I'm not familiar with, you know, with the, um, you know, how, how the internet, how internet available, what, what availability is like in Indonesia and in rural areas. But generally speaking, um, you know, as islands, we have many environmental factors that will also limit <laughs> our digital connectivity. So all of those different elements need to be, need to be uh, considered. And also, it's also a way for women to get involved, more involved in, um, in uh, you know, just basically entrepreneurship because they are the majority in um, the creative and cultural industries, the majority youth and women. Um, and so another policy that I think is extremely important is, is look, one that considers the barriers to access and entry for women based on a number of different determinants, could be cultural, but also the gender-based violence issue. It would be remiss of me not to mention that. Um, as we know that this has increased with COVID-19, and when you think about it in purely financial and economic terms, every woman that dies is a CEO that is no longer productive, no longer putting money into the economy. We really have to ensure that our policies are all encompassing in that way. Um, digital creates an opportunity for them to have a bit more freedom um, and a bit more um, resource and resilience in the face of these types of issues. I hope that Thank answers you. your question. Thank you, Ola Yinka. Very interesting indeed. Uh, Tatiana, so um, Ola Yinka also asked uh, and, and noted that there was no Empotech centers in the Caribbean. So maybe if you could quickly um, address this issue because we can follow up offline uh, with our partners here. Um, and then I would like to go back and just give a quick word to uh, 30 seconds takeaway message from each of the speakers, please. So Tatiana, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chantaline, and thank you for the questions and interest to Empretec. Uh, definitely, uh, it would be great to follow up on this discussion about uh, Empretec in uh, Indonesia. By the way, in Caribbean, we have uh, in English speaking in Guyana, but uh, you know, we also have uh, some uh, you know centers in Dominican Republic in Panama, so that there is quite a neighborhood that we can you know build up on uh, uh, further uh, in uh, in uh, Jamaica. But also on the um, you know on, uh, uh, Indonesia, thank you again for the questions about. Uh, so the details on Empratec, we definitely can set up a next meeting. And meanwhile, we will send, uh, we will share, you know, the details about uh, what it takes uh, to have an installation uh, in, a, uh, you know, in a country uh, in Indonesia. And uh, so that we have some, you know, specific you know, description of this, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, which we can pull up uh, together. Uh, so then, uh, <clears throat> We also share some details about the program itself, and then it would be really good to set up another webinar, a meeting where we can have uh, uh, key stakeholders, because of course we discussed that uh, entrepreneurship is a cross-cutting area, so then there will be a number of uh, interested uh, and very useful stakeholders uh, to be involved, and of course we will need to have uh, some sort of a leadership uh, uh, in, the, uh, you know, in, in the authorities uh, uh, to take it forward. So in terms of funding, yes, we need to look at the funding, because no Normally, you know, you know, there are some specific activities that need to be uh, undertaken so that we uh, uh, so that we can uh, transfer the methodology and certify national trainers and to do some other things that Indonesia can take forward uh, and protect on its own when the institutional basis uh, is created. So, uh, in terms of funding, again, we now have a really good opportunity with uh, uh, moving on to organize a pilot workshop uh, with the funding that we have for this pilot workshop under the financing framework uh, project uh, of uh, finance by UN. But this is just one workshop. Uh, also, good news is that it can help, uh, as a pilot, can help to mobilize uh, further attention and even further donors uh, uh, to, to to take it forward. And uh, unfortunately, Empratec um, uh, uh, workshop, which is six, six day, very intensive, uh, specific methodology uh, to change the mindset and to really uh, do this uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, developments uh, that also was uh, discussed by, uh, by Charles and um, Julian, uh, but it cannot be done online. We can do a number of activities, we can do a number of explanations 
about what it is, uh, but the real workshop we can only do when it is uh, uh, possible to do presential workshops. So then we can really discuss these modalities as well. But uh, while we are uh, moving towards that stage uh, in the uh, uh, post-COVID-19 recovery, we can also strategize uh, and think how we can move on. We actually have a number of activities also in the area, uh, in Vietnam and in Malaysia. So then we also can, can think how we can build it up uh, based uh, on the, what we already have. But we will be really more than happy to continue this discussion. And so then maybe uh, we will you know, share the contact details uh, and Chantaline will help us uh, to put all this together so that we'll have another meeting specifically focused on how uh, to do the installation of the Empretec Center in, uh, in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. I would like now to just roll down real quickly. So Alayinka, are you ready? 30 seconds. What do you take away? What do we need to do? You're muted. You're muted, Ola Winka. Apologies. There you go. <laughs> Based on the artist reform. Based on the artist reform. Based on the artist reform. Thank you. Quick and to the point. Julianne, please. Julianne, are you still with us? Am I seeing her? I'm going to go to Charles because Charles is here. So I'll give you a chance to Julianne to join us. Your 30 second takeaway, Charles. Yeah, I, I want to say that business mindset is central to the creation of a dynamic private sector. For it to deepen in any economy, you need institutional collaboration and appropriate policies. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, then uh, let me check again with Julian. And if not, then uh, Dr. Budiaso. Uh, as we already discussed, I really learned a lot here. Indonesian government is actually would like to promote inclusion through MSMEs. But now I learned a lot. Mindset, tools like Empretec, uh, entrepreneurship, and so as well as the creative thinking. Thanks a lot. I think that's to collaborate how then we can do better in the future. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. And from my point of view, um, and I'm sure Julian is busy running your 10 enterprises, uh, so we'll, we'll forgive her. <laughs> She's, she has a lot of, of people under her. Um, so I, I, from an entire point of view, I just want to thank you all. This was fantastic. Thank you for joining us. I think having Africa, Asia, and Latin America, Caribbean represented, having entrepreneurs, having centers of excellence, advisors, and the government at the table, international organization, is exactly the type of thing that we need if we want to start thinking outside the box. So with this, I'm not going to try to summarize this, uh, Yvonne. We will try to provide a summary with your team, but I want to give you back the floor to uh, close this meeting because it's always a pleasure, let me say, to collaborate with Indonesia um, because uh, of the professional and the passion that um, uh, your people are always displaying. Over to you. Thank you so much, Chantaline. We just want to thank you as moderator and all speakers, panelists, and all participants who have joined us in this side event.